two games, no wins, and a few home runs given up. We'll talk about the start to the season for the Cardinals coming up on b Shafe Daily. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of b Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you. It is Saturday, March 30th, 2024, on the heels of a second straight loss for the Cardinals to begin the season out in Los Angeles. The Apple TV game on Friday night, Dodgers 6, Cardinals 3. Another disappointing showing by the Redbirds. We'll break down what we saw from the game and how much we think it's reasonable to begin to be concerned about the state of things for the team amid this difficult start that feels a lot like, it really does feel a lot like what we saw all summer last year in 2023. The Cardinals struggling out of the gate, bit of a stumble. What's it mean? Let me know your thoughts, Cardinals fans, on what you think it means in the comment section below. You've been doing so. I encourage you to continue doing so. I understand that there's a lot of frustration out there, and it's hard to argue with you guys. I mean, it didn't look good for a second game in a row for the St. Louis Cardinals. We did see some good things from Zach Thompson, and you want to be able to kind of take the good with the bad, and you want to be able to spot the bright spots when they exist. But I will say, anytime a guy gives up three home runs in a game, you can say, well, other than those three pitches, he looked great. And that might be true. I think it was true last night. Some things were working well for Zach Thompson. He had some good movement on his pitches. His stuff seemed to be playable, at the very least, against a really potent lineup. However, You make a miss a couple times in a game, you make a miss three times in a game, and they punish you for all of them. That is a reflection of how you pitched. Unfortunately, that's the story of the night for Thompson, who goes five and a third, five runs, all earned, six hits, two walks, four Ks, but three home runs surrendered as the Dodgers beat the Cardinals six to three. Three home runs in five and a third, and five earned runs as an 8-4-4 ERA for Thompson for the game. And it is objectively true that if you took out those three pitches that were tagged for long balls, Mookie Betts doing it right off the jump of the game. And then we saw a couple of them from Teoscar Hernandez off of Zach Thompson, Miguel Rojas getting geo later on in the game, but Thompson giving up the three bombs and the, the third of which was the three run Homer, which was really kind of the dagger for the Cardinals hopes in the fourth inning because the the Redbirds did mount a bit of a rally in the eighth, scoring three runs. Nolan Gorman with a couple of hits and the, the big RBI, two RBI, I should say, double there in the eighth. Arenado driving in a run himself with a sack fly, which, I don't know, man. I think if Nolan Arenado is is seeing the ball and, and at his full strength, at his peak, he probably has the power swing to hit that over the fence. It just off the bat, you thought, oh, maybe this is going to be something here, something to light a spark, and it did plate the run. Cardinals' third run of the game and and their final run of the game. But for Arenado, you know, not a great couple of games to begin the season. And that kind of parlays after a not great spring training for Arenado statistically. And the other play that stuck out from him last night was the the chopper to third that ended up going as a double for Will Smith. It was a short hop. It was a difficult angle. But it almost seemed like Arenado kind of ducked out of the way of it, which is not what he does when he is kind of at his most crisp defensively at third base. So, a little bit jarring, a little bit unusual to see that. I know that we talked a lot about his uh, kind of defensive lapses last season, and then he really locked it down, I think, over the second part of the year. But that was something that kind of did crop up again for Arenado last night. And then again, when you get an RBI, you're not trying to, to rip the guy. But I, I think it would be a sign of him kind of being locked in where you want to see him offensively if he hits that ball with a little bit more power there in the eighth inning and perhaps uh, cuts the deficit even further by by giving it a ride for a home run. But Cardinals lose 6-3. to three. Some of the takeaways we mentioned with Arenado. How about those Zach Thompson? What do you think, Cardinals fans, of Thompson last night? Because I've seen sort of a split referendum on, on how people feel about the outing. 87 pitches, 59 of them for strikes. He told reporters after the game that evidently he's been uh, kind of working still to sync up some things mechanically, which is, I think, a little bit interesting because uh, that the spring training is over. This is the regular season now that has begun and still kind of working through some mechanical things. Uh, The quote from Jeff Jones, or I should say the tweet from Jeff Jones reporting from Los Angeles last night, Zach Thompson said this evening that he's been working through a couple of things to sync up his mechanics that he believes are at the root of tonight's lower velocity, not a health concern. Um, I think he was 92, 93 
mostly on the fastball, low 90s. That has been the case for Zach Thompson for a number of outings, though. That was that was something that was going on, I know, late in spring training. I don't know if people were really talking much about it, but I do know that was something going on a little bit for Thompson toward the tail end of Grapefruit League. And whether or not that is just a continuation that we saw from him on Friday night, up to interpretation, but all in all, I thought the stuff was still pretty solid outside of the homers, which is sounds like a completely ridiculous thing to say. And I objectively, believe me, I hear it coming out of my mouth. I'm not here to stump for Zach Thompson's performance. You've got to be better than that um, to allow three home runs. Like if you make three mistakes and you're facing a lineup like this Los Angeles lineup, those mistakes are probably going to be punished. And Mookie Betts right off first pitch of the game, I believe, from the uh, Dodgers perspective in the bottom of the first was the home run by Betts, who just continues to uh, go scorched earth on the league. His batting average did go down, though, in the game. 571, he's OPSing 1970. That's not a year, that's his OPS. couple of uh, strikeouts for Betts offensively drew a walk as well, but uh, those those Dodgers are no joke, and the Cardinals are finding that out firsthand. You can't make mistakes to this team. And maybe for that reason, this slow start to the year, and it's probably going to continue, let's be honest. Like, I don't know that the if the Cardinals can get out of here with one out of four, I think you take that. Maybe you pray for rain. I know that there was supposed to be rain in the forecast for Saturday. I'm recording this uh, about 2 p.m. Saturday afternoon before the 8 p.m.-ish first pitch. Uh, sounds like, as of right now, they are expecting to play. So it's not going to be the rain out that was maybe uh, foretold. But nevertheless... Just being able to scratch across one win in this series at this point, as sad as it sounds, I think would be considered a win for the Cardinals. Lance Lynn will be pitching Saturday night, taking on Yoshinobu Yamamoto, the Cardinal who wasn't. Once the salary expectations and demands ended up getting pretty crazy for Yamamoto, now in his first year in Major League Baseball. We'll see what the Cardinals can do against him. He's He's been giving up some contact so far and dating back to spring training, and he had the outing. Uh, over in Korea as well when when the Dodgers had that first really quick series against the Padres to start their season. So maybe the Cardinals could get something going. What is Lance Lynn going to look like in his return to Dodger Stadium? Look, I if it looks anything like what we've seen from the Cardinals uh, starting pitching the last couple of days, he's probably going to give up a couple of home runs, and it's going to be up to the offense to uh, win in sort of a shootout fashion by, by piling up five, six, or seven runs. Um, would I predict that going into it? No, I would not. But I have said that I think Lance Lynn can be a guy that if you're ranking the Cardinals rotation one through five, I might rank him toward the top half. I think he might be the number two on this team. Um, and and Michaelis didn't do anything to dispel those notions for me in game one on Thursday. Obviously, Sonny Gray, you're hopeful to have him be the the number one in this rotation. I believe I saw a tweet from a reporter that's out in Los Angeles. The, the expectation is... Uh, or at least like legally, according to the IL rules, I think Sonny Gray can be back on the 9th of April, I think is maybe the earliest. And so perhaps the latter end of that homestand, he could potentially make his Cardinals debut at Bush Stadium. But Lance Lynn, what's he going to bring to the table? Uh, we've speculated all offseason about what we're going to see from him, and now is going to be the first opportunity to really get a look at that. I'll be curious to see how he does. Um, when he went to the Dodgers last year, he lowered the ERA from comparing to what he did with the White Sox. He didn't strike out as many batters. I think uh, based on, I remember asking him about that at winter warmup, and he said there were some things, you know, the Dodgers pointed out that they, they thought could make him successful, and he was having the year he was having, so was was happy to oblige and, and try to, to work toward what they were looking to get from him. And that happened, and I think now you can kind of take a look in the off season and recognize you can take some of the good with the bad and, and pick out the things you want about the way your 2023 season went. What can Lance Lynn bring to the table? The Cardinals kind of need, I'm not going to call it a miracle because that would be an implication that Lance Lynn, um, you wouldn't expect him to be good, but the Cardinals need almost like a, a heroic effort from Lance Lynn. It feels like to sort of save the vibes of the early portion of the year here in this opening series. Not that, the season's over because of a bad trip to Los Angeles. It's not going to feel good. And there are going to quickly be the pressures that happened last April, where when you started slow, you never did really find a way to rebound from that and recover from that. That's going to be really, it's going to be real and tangible based on what the record's going to be. If this road trip continues the way it's gone so far, um, there's always room to be able to battle back. But I am telling you, I don't think this team has the, has the wherewithal to battle back if they start 8-19 and again like they did last year. I think that was the number, 8-19. and 19. 
if they have that kind of April, and I'm counting the last few days of March here as April, if they finish the, the month of April with that kind of record, it's going to be curtains, in my opinion. I don't think, because I think we saw last year the whole narrative of, well, it's early and you can battle back. And like, technically that's true. From a logistical standpoint, it's a lot more difficult to actually find a way to dig yourself out of that hole and do it and dealing with all the emotions and the the rigors of the season and having that record kind of staring you in the face and trying to rise above it is difficult. Last year's team showed a complete inability to overcome it. It's not a mean thing to say. It's just a true thing to say. They said it's early, it's early, it's early, and then it wasn't early. And then, as Paul Goldsmith alluded very early last season, when all the struggles were kind of happening, I think it was maybe May or June, he said, look, I think we're a good team, but at the end of the year, the record's going to show what kind of team we are, and you won't be able to hide from that number. It'll be what you are. And the Cardinals were a bad team last year, and then they went and didn't change a lot about themselves other than a few things in the rotation and a little bit of a, of a facelift for the bullpen. That's really all they did. And is the, the veteran leadership that they brought in, is that tangible enough to actually make a difference? We're going to see over 162 games this year. And if we see the same things that we have seen so far for the first two games, it's not going to be pretty. But you are facing the Dodgers. And we've talked about this notion of, well, how do you sort of balance that with knowing that you're going to have to beat the good teams to be a good team and knowing that none of the other teams are likely to be as good as this one, the one that the schedule makers had you face right out of the gate. You know, it's kind of an interesting Question, I think for Cardinals fans, they're not that interested in the question right now because they're just frustrated with the team. I can understand that element of it. But after a couple of weeks pass, what's it going to look like? Is it going to be substantially different once they stop playing against Earth's Mightiest Heroes, once they stop facing the Dodgers? Or is it going to be, well, those Padres have some good pitchers, and man, that Fernando Tatis is good. Like, we just got beat by a better team. Now you're one in five. You know, you pick up a win somewhere and you go, well, at least you're coming home against the Marlins. But, you know, they've got a really good young roster and they made the playoffs last year. And, like, none of that really becomes relevant. Who your opponents are is a, a thing to talk about now because you're only facing one team so far. Eventually, you're going to face them all. So it's not really too substantial in the long run. You're going to face some good teams. You're going to face some bad ones. You've got to beat up on the bad ones and you've got to hang and, and tread water against the good ones. And even the best ones, you've got to be able to pick off every now and again or your record's going to be somewhere in the probably mid-70s win range, and we'll be having a completely different conversation about this Cardinals team at the end of the year. Let me know what kind of conversation you think we'll be having about the Cardinals in the YouTube comments section below. You can click subscribe to this channel. I'm Brendan Schaefer. This is my St. Louis Cardinals writer channel, where I will be posting Cardinals content, videos, audio, etc., all throughout the season. If you're into that kind of stuff, join me along for the ride, whatever kind of ride it may be in 2024. Um, we started the channel last year and it was, it was the ride that it was. And we're all familiar with how that, how that went down. Perhaps this year can go differently, but so far it doesn't feel different. Right. And that's, I think where Cardinals fans are a little bit exhausted because they endured 2023 and it went the way that it went. And then you feel like already you are maybe right back into that seat again, buckled in and strapped in for another troubling six months. Hopefully that doesn't end up being the case, but if I had to guess what the comments are going to be, they're probably going to be along those lines. And again, I can't blame you. It is two games, but I'm not going to pretend you guys are dumb. I'm not going to pretend that it looks like something it doesn't look like. It looks bad. And uh, I don't know what I expected. I thought they would kind of tread water. I thought they'd lose a couple of these games. I thought maybe they could pull out a series split. That looks pretty unlikely as of right now. Still technically mathematically possible. Um, but you're, you're closer to being swept right now than it does feel like you're close to winning a game. And just kind of running down the lineup a little bit. These numbers will, they'll lie to you early on because it is so early after just a couple of games. But Gorman looks to be kind of locking in a little bit after the uh, slow start on opening day. He goes two for four with the RBI double, two RBI double. I keep calling it RBI double. He had two RBIs on the hit to right field in the eighth inning yesterday, but a couple of strikeouts. Contreras, three Ks. Victor Scott, three Ks. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be what it is. Victor Scott's going to be thrown out there. And we'll see if he sinks or swims. I'm going to totally own it that I I said, bring him up. I think you need to, you're, you're fighting against hope right here to find a spark for this team. And I know the skill set that Victor Scott has. And maybe that's one that if you can make enough contact, he can, he can try and have an impact on the game in that way. He had a defensive play last night that didn't look quite right. He broke back on a ball that he needed to be coming in on. And it was kind of funny because I thought 
mentally he was doing the the Midwesterners oh and then he ran in on the ball and, and made a nice diving athletic catch because he can make up for maybe a misjudgment there but I feel like he kind of recognized after a false step back like hey I got it Paul asked to get in on this ball and made the play. Mason Wynn was a bright spot from yesterday, two for three with a run scored. Uh, defensively had a couple of just absolutely ripped throws to first base. I think I might have to file a subpoena or something for StatCast because I don't know about those throws only being 89 or 90 miles per hour. I, if it's not StatCast, whoever it is that measured the the throw uh, throwing speed of the fielders, um, I saw somewhere at like 89, 90. But man, he... he Certainly toggled it up when he had to to, to make an, a couple of nice putouts over at first base. Um, maybe not going to be in the lineup for Saturday. By the time you listen to it, you might already know the answer to this. But uh, Ollie Marmel might be trying to mix in and get some other guys some opportunities. Uh, I think Brandon Crawford will be in there tonight. So we'll see what that ends up looking like. But I think the main takeaway for me, I, I said it after day one, the offense is my concern more so than the pitching. The pitching is you know going to be its own issue. Giovanni Gallegos had an interesting game. He had four strikeouts, so nasty stuff, but did give up the home run to Miguel Rojas, uh, an inning and two-thirds, so recorded five outs. And then JoJo came in for a clean uh, final inning for the Cardinals in this one. One inning, one strikeout, zeros other than that for the Cardinal lefty. Zach Thompson, man, like, I, you, yes, we saw some good things. No, I'm not going to. It, this is not a spring training game, so I'm not going to say, well, other than the three home runs, he looked good. That's a, a patently ridiculous statement, um, even if it's true. It's not something you can really hang your hat on. So I think Zach Thompson knows that, working through mechanical things, whatever. Um, hopefully get those up to speed, right? Because, again, this is the regular season. These games count. It's not like he can choose, like, oh, I, I would like to be up to speed, but I'm not. I'm working through some things. Guys have that, but it's, you know, it's go time. And I, I think in his case in particular, because you've got maybe one more start before Sonny Gray is going to be back eligible. And if you want to hold on to that rotation spot, and maybe even more importantly for his career, a roster spot, because if he's the guy that's your sixth starter, you could see a world in which he gets sent back to Memphis, and that's a place that Zach Thompson very much, very much does not want to be. It, it, whether he would say that out loud, I'll say it for him. I know that he doesn't want to be there because he's been kind of riding that shuttle after a little bit, of, a bit, little bit of time. Matthew Libertor kind of was on on that boat in that bus, whatever you call it, and doing that same thing. And now Libertor is getting to be in the bullpen, so he's going to be kind of locked into a roster spot. Thompson, quote unquote, won the competition to be in the rotation if needed. He was needed because of the gray injury, but now what happens if he, you know, the the eight four four ERA doesn't look good. I think the Cardinals know that. I, I think he pitched better than an eight four four ERA, but at the same time, if you make those kinds of mistakes to those kinds of teams and you start thirty games throughout a season, your ERA is not going to be sterling. So, as much as I do think there were some building blocks for sure for Zach Thompson from last night, he kind of has to do it in a hurry here with whatever his next opportunity is in the rotation five days from now, I assume he'll still be in the rotation at that point. He's going to have to probably show something. Otherwise, I could see him ending up on that Memphis shuttle once again because they say, well, we got to have somebody stretched out that we trust, and we like Zach Thompson enough to trust him uh, to fill in if we need someone to fill in again. And so maybe that ends up being the, the role that he fills. Or he can force the issue, pitch really well, and have the Cardinals go, look, I don't know if he's a long reliever. I don't know if he's a six-man rotation for a little bit. I don't know what it's going to be. But Zach Thompson, I think, with a good start in five days, can sort of cement his roster spot in so much as that's even possible uh, when you have just the the factors of the 13-man rotation. Um, pitching staff, I should say, not rotation. Just working against you. They can't carry more pitchers than they can carry. And that's just the rules of Major League Baseball. And so when they bring Sonny Gray back into the fold, somebody does have to go. And it would make sense that if he's taken that rotation spot and Zach Thompson hadn't performed super well with it, that could be the, the result of it. But I do like some of the things I saw from him. I thought the stuff played well, but you, you when you're only going 91-92 on the fastball and, and some of those fastballs get hit, I mean, just an absolutely hung breaking ball to Teoscar Hernandez for the three-run homer. Um, non-competitive pitch to me, and you can't, you don't have that much margin for error to play with. And I, I, you know, a guy could say, "Ah, man, the three pitches, I, I made mistakes. I wish I could have those back." But there are also throughout a game other pitches where you go, "Dang, that one could have been roped." Um, but the guy just, you know, mishandled, misjudged it, whatever the case is. So a lot of times, probably these pitchers make more than three mistakes in a game. The three are the ones that get punished. But I bet the the punish rate for the Los Angeles Dodgers. A lot higher than it's going to be for most lineups because one through nine, um, they are pretty stacked. The 14 strikeouts, I wanted to, to touch on the offense. Offensively, the Cardinals were pretty, you know, pretty lame again last night. 
outside of putting together a little bit of rally in the eighth inning. Um, I saw the first inning from Bobby Miller and thought a couple of things. One, he's their fifth starter when they're fully healthy. Like, is this guy, they've got so many, they've got a full rotation basically on the injured list, and Bobby Miller's like 24, 25, kind of looking for his breakout season. I think he's going to find it. He was disgusting. The strikeout of Brendan Donovan to begin the game last night on, I don't know, I don't care what you call the pitch. I guess it would have been a changeup, but it moved like a Frisbee off the plate. If you saw it, you know what I'm talking about. I couldn't, I might, I gasped. I couldn't believe the pitch from Bobby Miller. I'm like, okay, if this is what the Cardinals are dealing with, could be a long night, could be like a historic type of night. You know, for a while they were getting perfect gamed until Gorman got the first base hit, middle innings or whatever it was. Bobby Miller was ridiculous. Um, struck out so many guys that he he couldn't get further than six innings because of pitch count. He probably could have started the seventh if they had really wanted, but the way he emphatically got out of a bit of a jam in the sixth and uh, did so with another strikeout. I think that was his final batter. 93 pitches for Bobby Miller. Six innings against the Cardinal lineup. Two hits allowed. One walk allowed. 11 strikeouts and no runs. Um, the Cardinals were just swinging through everything, man, or looking at strike three. Umpires might have helped him out a little bit, but when you're when you're dealing it like that, you can tend to get the benefit of the doubt from, from the blue, and that might have happened a little bit, but that's no excuse for what happened to the Cardinals. 14 strikeouts isn't going to cut it. Um, was was last night a picture of things to come? Maybe for guys like Jordan Walker, who's struggling out of the gate. A lot of guys are. Struck out two times last night. Did have a hit, though. Victor Scott, three strikeouts last night. He's got, I think, four on the two games so far. Reached base on the error and stole the base, but Victor Scott's going to have to show a little bit more, obviously. Um, I did say anything they get from him offensively is a bonus, and I still do believe that, but I also think, you know, you can't bat zero. For your uh, for your season, so they're going to have to to do some things here. I would switch Scott and Mason Win. I understand the right, left, right, left, and they have the balance throughout the lineup. I want Victor Scott to immediately be if he happens to get on base, driven in by a Donovan or a Goldschmidt at the top of the order. I want Victor Scott batting ninth, um, which again Mason Win's got a three thirty three batting average after a two for three last night was lifted for Matt Carpenter at the end of the game. I don't really think that matters. Um, they were down by three. They were not starting a rally. I understand the point that if Mason Wynn gets on, he can maybe steal a base, and then Donovan can... Um, objectively, it's kind of like, all right, if you want to start Carpenter the next day, start him. Um, I don't know. Handedness maybe played into it. I think you probably just let Mason Wynn take the at-bat, but that's not even a big enough gripe for me. Like, you're just kind of looking for things to be mad about, probably. Or, I would say it this way, you're already mad, understandably so, and then you see something else that makes you mad, and you want to talk about it. Um, I don't really care too much about the the Mason Wynn versus Matt Carpenter thing at the end of that game last night, but I would have Scott bet in ninth. Um, I think Mason Wynn's the better hitter right now than Victor Scott at this stage of the respective stages of their careers, and so you get Wynn some more at-bats, and I think Scott's the more potent base runner, so if he does happen to get on base, he's basically in scoring position would be my assumption for when you turn things over to the top of the lineup. But everybody's struggling right now outside of Goldsmith in the first game and Gorman in the second game. And even Gorman had two strikeouts last night of the uh, 14 compiled by the Dodgers pitching staff. Uh, Donovan was responsible for a couple. Contreras had three. Burley had one. He had 14 strikeouts. The only guys who didn't, that might be a quicker story to tell. Arenado and Mason win. Uh, and Carpenter did not strike out, but he only had the one at bat to end the game. So Cardinals fans, let me know how you're feeling and thinking about the start to the season. I know it's, I know it's been rough. I know there aren't really too many signs that it's just going to flip into gear. And I think after a year of of bad baseball last year, you're kind of conditioned to just sort of expect it to be a little bit of a, of a of a struggle at this point. And it might be. It certainly might be for as long as this Dodgers series goes on. And I do think if the Cardinals just get whipped by the Dodgers and then they turn around and they take two of three from the Padres and then two of three from the Marlins, and suddenly, you know, you're probably still, what, four and six at that point? But I, I think that would still be okay. You could get swept by the Dodgers and then go two of three, two of three. And then you have to recognize, look, if you really are going to expect to contend when you potentially have to face the Dodgers in a playoff series, you're going to have to do something differently. You're going to have to add something. Um, and again, I like this lineup on paper. I don't know if it has a consistent group of guys that are going to go out and, and, and not give away at bats enough to where you can avoid the games where you score zero, one, two, three runs so often. So far, we've got a, got a one and a three on the board for the Cardinals offensively. So maybe there's something they can do to kind of shake up the dynamic of that lineup. I don't know what it is. It's almost just like a magnetism that the Cardinals are going to be a hot, cold lineup. It's been this way for years. Um, I, I, I Anecdotal, 
right? I don't necessarily have all the data in front of me to go, well, it feels like the Cardinals are hot, cold, but actually here's what the numbers say about the number of zero run, one run, two run games they've scored compared to the games where they, they score double digits. Like, I, I guess I could do that that uh, look up. If anybody else has like the statistical, you know, I'm sure like maybe fan graphs, it might be like a good baseball reference if you subscribe to their thing. You might be able to find that data, but it just feels like the Cardinals are that type of offense where they, they've been pretty hot, cold, they'll score a bunch, and then they'll go for a period of time where it's like, they're lucky if they if they can put a, a crooked number on the board in any of the nine innings in that game. So I don't know if that's necessarily where you're going to be able to just make a massive difference um, during the trade deadline because I think you'll look at all nine positions and say, eh, you're at least average to slightly above average at all of them. And so um, it'll be difficult to find, all right, that's the position to target. That's where you can make an incremental upgrade or maybe a substantial upgrade. But there may be spots in the rotation or the pitching staff that they'll be able to do that. And I think if they're in the mix, they play well against other teams. And that's maybe a, a rather generous viewpoint to take based on what we've seen. But it is the Dodgers they're facing. So if the Dodgers are just the team that's just like, yep, they're beating up on everybody. And to beat them, you've got to figure out something else with your roster uh, in, in, in July and in early August, whenever the deadline is this year, then maybe that's an element of this. But if the Cardinals are struggling against all the competitive teams, you know, this might be another type of year where they do not add at the deadline and the selling could be much more painful than it was last year. Like if they have a losing record in July, it's going to be Paul Goldschmidt, either Arenado traded in July or traded in November. Like those things are very much on the table if this season ends up with like a 90 loss pace as you approach the deadline. I think that's possible. So let me know what you think, Cardinals fans. Um, off to a slow start, but wanted to get some thoughts out here. 25, 30 minutes reacting to the game. Let me know what you want to hear me talk about too, because we'll obviously be recapping all of the games on the, on the B shape daily podcast. And, and that'll go on the, the YouTube channel here, youtube.com slash at B for 12. But if there's any kind of, as the season goes, as you know, there'll be off days, there will be um, kind of, kind of broad topics. There'll be players. We want to hone in on and ask, you know, what's the deal with this guy? What's going on with him? Uh, what do we see from him? Let me know who you're wanting to hear about, what you're wanting to hear about topic wise. And uh, we'll continue to get you guys some good content here on YouTube. Thank you guys so much for listening. As always, that is going to do it for this edition of the show. And we will talk to you next time on Be Shape Daily. Peace.